Oops. Yes, I don't know. It's not Halloween anymore, so everything feels like. All right. Let's get started. All right. So we got a lot to cover today, so we're going to jump right into it. Um, so we looked before at local routing. So when a one machine, so when one machine wants, is on the same local network as another machine and it wants to send an IP packet to it, so A, how does it know that it's on the same local network? Yes? Check the subnet. Check the subnet. If it's on the local network, then it does what? Yeah? Uh, does it send an ARP request? Sends an ARP request to do what? To have it sends an ARP request asking to all machines asking who IP does this belong to and then whose IP that belongs to sends back an ARP reply with its MAC address. Yep. And then what does it do? It writes it into the ARP table. Yes. And then what? Yeah. In the back. Wait. What? Do you raise your hand? No. Do you want to answer? All right, so then what happens? So we've gotten our reply back. We now have a mapping between the IP address and the physical address. Now what does it do? Don't you just send what you want to send to them? How? Did you start writing bytes? Transport layer is neither TCP or UDP. We have the right to decide what. Yeah, but let's. We're, we haven't talked about them yet, so let's ignore them. So this is everything below that, right? So now I know where I want to go. Now how do I actually make this packet ready to go? Create an Ethernet frame and transmit it. With what? What do you put in that Ethernet frame? So it has the IP layer of the packet. It already knows. It knows its source IP. It knows the destination IP. It takes that packet and encapsulates it in an Ethernet frame, which has the source MAC address and the destination MAC address. This destination MAC address it just got from that ARP reply. So this is if the node is on our local network. right? And we know how to answer that question of, is it on the local network? We can easily answer that. The question then becomes, well, what happens if it is not on our local network? Right? Which is going to happen constantly. Right? When you talk to Google, Google is not in your local network. You can easily check this. You can look at, um, open up a terminal and run ifconfig, and you can see your IP address and your subnet mask. So you'll know what subnet you're on, and you can do a DNS request to figure out what's the IP address of Google, you'll be very easily be able to tell that that is not in your local network. So how does a packet then get from our computer to Google? takes a, uh, I mean, I guess URL, text, whatever you want, and transform it, transforms it into an IP address by going through a bunch of other bigger domain name servers and then to smaller domain name servers. Yes, so at its core, the important thing is it maps domain names to IP addresses. So it doesn't, URLs have a lot of other junk in them, right? But one part of that is the domain name. So, <coughs> Let's ignore that. So just like in our local network case, right? We know we want to talk to a specific IP address, right? We just know we want to send an IP packet from us to this other address. This other address. So a, how do we tell what the, that it's that it's not on our local network? What's that? Can't you just ping it? No. How do you send a ping packet out? Yes. 
guess, but you would send a ARP request, but if nobody replies, then you know it's not on your local network? No. That could just mean it's down. Mm -hmm. or not responding to ARP replies or something. Yeah. subnet, it's not in your subnet, so you know this machine must be in some other network. Do you know exactly what that network is? No, right? That would be an insane amount of information for one computer to have, right? To have to know about every single network out there. All you need to know is what IP address do you want to talk to? Well, that's part A is what you need to know. But the question then is, well, where do you send this packet, right? You can't just throw it into the air and hope that Google catches it at some point, right? Kind of. Right, so where does this packet actually go? So think about your home network, right? Where do your packets actually go? To the router. Why is the router? of networks, right? If we have a completely con closed network, then there's no way a packet can get from us to Google, right? Try this at home. Unplug from your router the external internet cable. See how well your connection goes, <laughs> right? You can still talk to all the hosts on your local network. You can still transfer files between machines. You can do all that kind of fancy stuff, but you will not be able to talk to any external hosts. Right? And so the idea is in every network you have one machine, it's usually called, we'll use the term gateway rather than router because gateway is more general. There's one machine that's the gateway that knows how to talk to the rest of the networks. So actually we brought my, my drawing tablet, so this should go a little bit easier. Uh, we think about that, so you have, let's say in your home network, you have your computer and you have your mobile phone and maybe you have some storage server Right? They're all basically on the same subnet connected to some gateway. Right? Then this has a connection where? Excuse me, man. PPP to the ISP. Yeah, it has some kind of connection to some ISP network, which is part of some vast internet that I'll draw in kind of nebulous cloud. And somewhere there will be a connection to a gateway at Google, which will eventually, and there could be other networks here, there could be another gateway here, and then finally get to some Google server that can actually reply to your, your request. So an important thing to always keep in mind is thinking about like how much information should I need to know? So should your mobile phone have to worry about the infrastructure of everything in here? No, that would be crazy. Right? That would be nuts. Like, think about every time AT&T decides to move switches around, they would have to update everyone on the internet, all, I don't know, even know, billion devices is probably a safe guess. It's probably a, an understatement. Right. So, but what we need, so think about this from our perspective. So as the, the uh, we'll go with the client here. As this client, so we know we want to talk to some IP address. We'll call it, G, eh, G is confusing. Um, we'll call it B. We're going to talk to Bing now. Let's switch that up. We're going to have a client. We want to talk to Bing. We are, uh, we're Adam's machine. So we're A. We want to talk to I So we are IP address A. We want to talk to IP address B. What? So we know from before, we know our subnet, right? And our subnet allows us to say whether the IP address B is on our local network or not. So it tells us it's not. What's the next thing we need to know? We need to know who is our gateway or who do we give traffic to, right? So we need extra information. There's a gateway or the other way to think about this, as we'll see, is a routing table. So we need to know, okay, I know this isn't on my local network, so who do I give this packet to? Who can actually take this packet and send it where it needs to go so it will hopefully get closer to its home, right? 
Again, at this level, at IP, we have no guarantees that it's ever actually going to get there. Just like you can send packets to your router, but if it has nowhere to put them, it just drops them. Right? Cut this link, and your packets aren't going anywhere. You only have one gateway. To your local network, yeah. Always. I mean, you could pay for more, but you'd have to have some complicated system set up to actually use the bandwidth for each one. That's not, not that complicated. You don't even need it to, well, you, it depends on how you want to use it. If you want to double your bandwidth or you want redundancy. In case AT&T has a problem, you can switch over to Verizon. So actually, a lot of companies will do this, is they will have two internet connections just in case. Right? So you could have basically a gateway that is aware and decides between the two, or as we'll see, and this is what I want us to move away from just thinking about a single gateway, is a routing table can specify exactly where to route packets to what host depending on the IP address. So you may want to split your traffic and say, I don't know if you can say this, but uh, yeah, you, well, that would be silly, I think. I guess tech, anyways, it doesn't matter. But you could, you could say something like, uh, let's say you have a more complicated network and you say, hey, if we want to talk to Google, it's actually cheaper for us to talk to Google through Verizon. So use this gateway to talk to Google. But if you want to talk to Bing, use, which one did I use? Use AT&T's network because that's actually going to be uh, cheaper for, and faster for us. So, so what does the gateway do? So let's say we, we ask basically, okay, we know it's not on our local network. That's not uh, we know it's not on our local network, but so we take our packet, we're going to essentially, as we'll see, we do exactly what we did before, but the Ethernet layer is going to be from us to the gateway, but the IP will still be from A to B. We send that to the gateway. The gateway gets the packet, and then what does it do?
on the same local network and they know each other's IPs? Well, the gateway at least knows the gate's IP. So, the, with, so let's think about the first part you said. So they have to be on the same local network. Why? Uh, well, I guess that's just what where we start off with our ARP request is broadcasting to our local network. But it, you're not on, I don't know the answer other than that you, you, you can't get out without going <laughs> to the gateway. On the yeah, we only know how to move packets one hop, which means we need to know the ARP, the physical address of the next machine to give the packet to. That machine must be in our local subnetwork, right? Because if, let's say we wanted to talk from A to M, we know because of our subnet it is not a multi-hop, it is a direct, deliver, direct delivery. And so we'll do an ARP request, figure out M's MAC address, and just make a packet with a source MAC of A and the destination MAC of M and just send it directly to M, right? But in this case, we know that the IP address B is not in our local network, so we need to send this packet to our gateway. And in order to send it to the gateway, we need to figure out the MAC address of the gateway. And so to do that, we need an ARP request. So fundamentally, because every hop that you gotta think is that direct delivery, right? So like from that, the perspective of um, A, G has to be on its subnet in order for it to actually send the traffic. So this is if you've ever configured this manually on like the command line in Linux, you'll get an error if you try to, if you don't quite know what you're doing and thinking about all these different cases, you can easily make a subnet that is not on the same network as your gateway and then you'll have massive problems. Cool. Uh, what else, what else did you say? I just focus on that part. Uh, well, I said that they needed to know each other's IP, but I, I mean, you don't, because that's, what, you don't need to know each other's address, that's what the ARP, ARP does, like when we're broadcasting that. ARP app. does what? Maps well, what? ARP maps uh, the MAC addresses to IPs. What, it, you broadcast out, it maps, yeah, it maps the MAC address to an IP, like when you broadcast, you ask who has this IP. So that would mean that you know the MAC address and you're getting the IP address. That's what I mean by maps too, like a function, right? So like ARP, you think about ARP as a mathematical function, it takes in what and returns what? Uh, it takes in an IP and returns a MAC. Yes, so it maps IP addresses to MAC addresses, right? It also does keeps a backward mapping, but for purposes of thinking about it, right, it does this, this mapping, right? So thinking about it that way, then A must know the IP address of G, right? So A yeah, can be the gateway. Yes, it needs to know the gateway's IP address. It does not need to know the MAC address because it can find that out through an ARP request. Third thing you said is like three things. No, I think that was that's all I, I think intended to say. They need to know they on the same network and they need to know their IPs. Cool. All right. Great. So yeah, so the way to think about this is there's we know it's indirect delivery because the destination IP address is not in our local network. So we figure out, well, where's the first hop of this this packet going? Where does this packet go? You consult your routing table, which will tell you the gateway to use. You then do a direct delivery between you and the gateway. The gateway gets this and says, okay, this isn't destined for me, this is an indirect, and it's not, uh, it's not in my local network, so I know it needs to go to my gateway, so it sends that along, that, keep, that process keeps happening, until finally the last router receives that packet, the last gateway, and then what does that gateway say? <coughs>
Cool. So we are, we're going to have an example where we are this machine 121 and we want to talk to 110. And okay, one important thing that we, so we brought up in this process, right? Nobody actually knows whether this packet is getting closer to its final destination, right? There's absolutely no guarantee that any, any of those routes and hops along the way, right? Anybody could have made a mistake and either sent the packet backwards to the previous gateway or to a third gateway that sent it back to the first one. And so you end up in this loop. You end up in all kinds of routing loops. So clearly we don't want packets to live forever, right? And just keep infinitely cycling around the network. Although that would be a really cool way to like store data. Um, I've heard of some weird cases of people exploring like trying to use pings to like store network data. So just ping some servers with like a thousand bytes, and then you don't actually have to store those bytes. So when you get the ping back, you just send it back to them. And you can do this with enough servers and redundancy that now you're using essentially the network as your storage device, uh, which is kind of cool, but super weird and probably mean for everyone else who's trying to watch Netflix. Um, oh, yes, so there is a field in the IP packet called the time to live. So each each gateway, each step on the hop uh, along the route actually doesn't just leave that field completely, uh, doesn't leave the IP packet completely unchanged. They will decrement the time to live value. And then once it hits zero, they drop the packet. And depending on the router, will sometimes try to send a message back to the source to say, hey, this message couldn't be delivered. Um, and that's an ICMP message. So. So every hop along the way, so usually TTL starts at, I think, 255, I want to say. Um, and this actually has security impact. So this is actually how, um, I believe, I don't think they do this anymore, but um, AT&T and I think also Verizon used to, used to or still do charge extra to have tethering on your phone. So to have your phone turn into a Wi-Fi hotspot so that you can connect your computer to it. They wanted to charge you extra for that. So people, of course, didn't want to do that, so they just install applications that would act, turn on the Wi-Fi, um, and act as routers. But AT&T could detect this because your packets would have their TTL decremented because your packet would go from your laptop to your phone. The phone would decrement the TTL value and then send it to AT&T. So AT&T could see every packet you're sending has a TTL value of whatever, 254 when it's coming from the phone, but when you're using tethering, it's 253. And so they actually use that to either throttle you or send you a nasty notice saying like, you're not actually paying for tethering. Don't do this, so. Um, you actually have like important, interesting security applications here. Because then the alternative is once you know about this, you just don't do that on the phone, right? Or you um, change other things, so. Cool. Okay, so the important things here is that at every step of this process, right, so this is the important thing to remember. So if we have host A, as we talked about here, so host A will be 121, and host B will be dot 10, do they know each other's MAC address? Uh, I'm not, I don't think we'll talk about it now. But 
me as much detail, but I'll briefly mention you can also use TTL to try to map networks. So, uh, and try to figure out the path that a packet is taking. Um, the idea is some machines, when you drop a packet, so like a router, will send you back uh, an ICMP message, which is at the IP layer. So that's, that's what ping is. Ping is an ICMP request message, so it has no TCP or UDP layer, it's just an IP layer packet. Um, one of those types of messages, it says, I believe, TTL exceeded. So anybody ever use traceroute? Fun little network tool that maps the network. What it does is it sends a packet out with a TTL of one, sends that out, and then tries to see who responded back with that ICMP message dropped message. And then it sends out a packet with TTL of two. So that should get to the next hop, and then it sees who dropped it there, and then three. So it keeps sending these back until the packet actually gets to the destination. So you can estimate roughly the number of hops that it's taking, and you can figure out kind of what machines are in between here and there. That's actually a super fun thing to do if you want to play around and learn more about networks, because oftentimes, uh, I believe by default, Traceroute will try to do a reverse DNS lookup, which tries to map the IP address to the domain name. So usually that will tell you something about where that machine is physically located. So we'll have things like if you go through routers in like AT&T or Comcast in LA, they'll be called like lax.comcast.net or something like that with random identifiers. So you can actually get a nice indication of the pack way that your packets are flowing through the network. Cool. So the main way that packets are routed, as we talked about, is just hop by hop. So every hop knows where the packet needs to go. Uh, it used to be when they first actually created the, the um, initial like ARPANET, they actually had it that the source could specify what route the packet should take. Um, and it seems ridiculous, but actually if you think about back then, they had an extremely unreliable network. So if we wanted to talk to comp between two machines and we knew that an, one path was bad because somebody wasn't adminning that or the route was down, we could still talk, then I could specify exactly where I wanted packets to go. Um, and there's actually an option in IP packets called source routing, but I, I think it'd be interesting research to see if this is actually ever used because you can think there's a lot of security problems here, right? If I could force packets to go through certain paths, I could try to take down certain physical links by forcing a lot of packets to go through one physical link, um, all kinds of bad stuff that you could do. So a key, very key aspect of, the, um, of this indirect delivery is the routing table. So this, for those of you that end up becoming and dealing with networks, this is what you live and die by is the routing table. So this is something that you should always check to make sure that it's set up correctly um, because this tells you how packets should be routed. Uh, on most <coughs> Unixes, you can do route-n and that will tell you the route. If you're on a Mac, you have to, it's really dumb, but it uses netstat. You have to use, I think it's like netstat-r for the routing table, and that will show you the routing table. So, uh, oh, dash n is always a nice, handy option. Dash n usually says, do not map IP addresses to do domain names. So this usually actually makes the process take a lot longer because it has to do these DNS queries. So for most options, like route does this, TCP dump <coughs> does this, so if you TCP dump with the dash n flag, that also means don't resolve DNS names. Um, so if we did this on a machine, you could see something like, if it's here, go here. So the way to read this is the destination, so it's in a descending <coughs> order of specificity, if that makes sense. So. And we can see that by the gen mask. So the mask says this is all ones, right? 32 ones. So you and that with the destination, and you say, okay, or you and the packet where you're trying to, to send with that and compare it with the destination. And if it's correct, then this is where you send it. So this says, hey, if you want to talk to 192.168.1.24, send it out on physical interface zero, eat zero. Right? If you want to talk to anybody in the 192.168.1 slash 24, and we know it's a slash 24 because of this gen mask, which means the last 
octet doesn't matter, then send it out on Ethernet zero. So this actually, you can read it more information about the subnet here. This essentially says this is your subnet. They also say, hey, if you want to send it to 127, anything in the 127, which is what IP address range? Local. Local, it's home, it's this machine. So 127001 is what's mostly used, but actually you can use any address in the 127 range. And all of those will go back to that same machine. So you can see it's actually a different physical interface. So this is why if you've ever tried to ping or, I don't know, if you're sending traffic to yourself on 127001 or localhost, which is a DNS name that's mapped to 127001. If you tried to do a network, if you tried to do TCP dump on your network interface, you would never see any packets there because it uses this dummy device that's a local, that's a local device. Finally, if it doesn't match any of those, so this is the zeros, this means the default, this is like a catch-all that says, if the IP address we're trying to send to doesn't match any of these, then send it to 192.168.1.1. So that's that gateway column. And so then how do we know? Um, and so all these flags basically will say up, that these are up, H if it's a route to a specific host. Um, so you can do super cool things with this. You can set up routing tables where if a packet, I, what if I had to do? I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, yeah, you can, anyways, you can do all kinds of cool stuff in here. Um, while doing this. And you can do this on any machine. You can look at your routing table and see what's going on. An interesting thing to do would be to connect wirelessly to a network and then connect physically to another network and then see what's your routing table like because that will actually tell you where your packets are actually going to go if they're going to go on the wireless or the Ethernet. Cool. All right, we're going to talk about this. So yeah, basically the way this table works is you search for matching host address. So you just search and you say, from most specific to least specific, does the address I want to talk to match any of this? So any questions on route indirect delivery, aka routing, <coughs> aka how packets actually work and get to where they're supposed to get? All right, there's another wrinkle that we're not going to talk about, but I want you to be aware of. Um, this seems very straightforward, but if you think about the perspective of somebody like an ISP, right, who gets a packet and says, okay, there's this destination address, what of the gateways of all the different things I'm connected to, where does this actually go, right? And does anybody, I believe you can, can you actually do that? move IP addresses between providers. I think you can or used to be able to. Um, anyways, the short version is that there's another protocol called BGP, which is the Border Gateway Protocol, which is how big ISPs talk to each other and say, hey, if you want to route, like I control all of these networks, so if you want to talk to any of these subnets, send packets to me. And so it's this uh, pretty complicated protocol, of, and it's all based on trust, and there's only something like 100 BGP nodes uh, in the world. But this actually leads to problems of when people got, so there was, I can't remember what country it was, but one of the countries wanted to ban Twitter inside their country. What The way they chose to do this was they announced a BGP route that says if anybody wants to go to Twitter's network, send it to us, and then they would just drop all those packets. The problem is they announced that to the entire world, and so every other gateway and every other ISP was like, oh great, Twitter's going to this ISP. So they sent all the traffic there and dropped it. So Twitter was out literally for everyone and there was, no, there was nothing Twitter could do because it wasn't their fault or their problem. So um, it had to take like a coordinated effort from people to realize that, to get the government to take that off um, because it's a very trusting protocol where if you say you can route somewhere, then they'll let you do it. All right, so back to UDP. So now we've built up all of our physical layer, which we're ignoring, the link layer, the internet layer now, which I guess it is third from the bottom. Maybe you were correct. I don't know, third from the bottom is a very non-specific way to describe things. <laughs> um, cool, so 
now we have looked at UDP and what we saw and talked about with UDP is UDP is simply a very thin layer I think that is on top of IP. So it does not provide any additional delivery guarantees, any other types of security mechanisms. Um, so we already discussed this. And so now we can actually go back to our spoofing example and we can understand that if we send a spoofed UDP request and we are not on the local network of either the server or the trusted client here, will we get the reply? No. No. Because none of those, the destination IP address is client, trusted client. None of these hops along the way will ever get the packet closer to us. So if we want to do this, we have to actually be able to spy on any of those links and any of those hops to actually see that reply. Which, unless you're the NSA or large government organization, is highly unlikely. Or you could compromise one of these switches along the way, right? That would be another avenue of attack. Or, sorry, uh, more cool stuff. Okay, let's go back here. Uh, so think about this from a security perspective, right? So we saw that if we're on the same local network as a machine, we can basically trick it to send all traffic through us. So we can fundamentally, if we're on the same network, we can see all the traffic that's happening there, right? But we can't see all the traffic that's happening here, or here, or here, or in the target network. Right? Unless we somehow get visibility there. I, what I was going to say is super interesting is that so, uh, so the internet is made between two companies, companies, countries, basically through underground cables across the ocean. Um, and so there are, I believe, I think there are real reports of um, like submarines going down in there from countries and putting in tap devices on these under on these underwater cables so that they could see all the traffic that was actually going across the country, um, which is pretty cool. All right, cool. Okay, so we talked about IP spoofing. We cannot get the packet back. And we talked about IP, uh, UDP has ports, source and destination, and when you reply to a UDP request, you set the source port as the destination, sorry, you set the destination port as the source port that was sent to you. Um, which means that if we wanted to spoof a UDP request, and we cannot get a copy of this packet because we are not in the local network of either of the two entities, then we need to actually create a spoof UDP reply by guessing what the destination port address is, which is actually not that difficult because we have 65,000 tries. So the either two ways to think about it, if we want to guarantee that we're successful, we send 65,000 replies. A problem there is that the server's request may get, or the server's reply may get there within all of those, um, but maybe we can DOS the server or something to guarantee that it's not going to send the packet out. Or we just try 65,000 times, and one time we'll be right. If we just keep doing that, eventually we will hit it. And so, um, so yeah, we can still do that in a stealthy way. Cool. All right. So, so now when we think about attacking, right? So let's say we want to attack some remote system. So there's some server. Let's say uh, we are hired to do some penetration testing, and I'm going to go throw this away, so don't, don't be scared, I'm not leaving. Uh, we are hired to do a penetration test, and we uh, have a target remote server. So how would we go about breaking into that server? Server is physically located. Why? Eh, let's say it's it's a remote penetration penetration test. Although there are physical ones as well, but let's say it's a remote one where all we need to do is from the comfort of our home.
week. So um, how do we, let's think about it this way. How do we know what clients that that server trusts? So let's think about it even more and step back. So what, what actual information do they give to us? The company who's hiring us to do this penetration. Trying to talk to these services, you just want to know 
because the way to think about it, so the kind of the physical analogy would be knocking, going through that apartment complex and knocking on 65,000 doors to see who opens it. Or if you want to be stealthier, you just wait until they're about to open the door and then you run away. Right? Because you don't want to actually talk to anybody. Um, or this, I guess, I guess it would be the other way would be writing a letter to all 65,000 apartment numbers in a given apartment complex and then seeing which ones come back as undelivered from the post office. Right? That would be really annoying. Don't do that. But it would be funny. <laughs> Uh, cool. Okay, so so if you get back a port unreachable message, then you can infer that that port is closed, that nobody is listening on that port. Um, but the other thing is you need to understand what do the operating systems actually do, right? Because so why does it actually matter what the operating systems do? Because of this, it's important to understand how the operating system actually responds, right? Like, how will the operating system respond if you send 65,000 UDP packets to it? And so, part of what happens is there's actually a limit on the number of error messages that say this ICMP uh, port unreachable message. So, you have to configure your scan, so 80 messages every four seconds. So, you have to configure your scan to send less than this, otherwise, you may hit this limit and you'll start thinking that ports are open when they're not. So we can use a tool called Nmap to do this. This is actually an incredibly useful um, network tool. It's a little bit more on the offensive side, but it's still useful for figuring out what's going on. I sometimes actually use this when I forget like what port uh, the RabbitMQ guest interface <laughs> runs on. So I'll just run Nmap against it to figure that out, and it'll tell me what port's open, or like against a printer. 
a lot of times printers will have configuration pages on a specific port, so I just end map it to figure out what it is. So the, let's see, the dash S is a connect scan, I believe, and dash capital U is the uh, battery jet, is the um, UDP port scan. So, and it's an open source tool. That's, we're always much happier to use open source tools that we can look into and figure out how they work. Um, so it will do this scan and it will say that, um, it'll, it'll scan this and it'll say 1,445 ports scanned but not shown below are in state closed. So it will show me all the open ones. So this scan found that UDP port 137 and UDP port 138 are in an open state. So now what do we know? We just ran a scan, let's say this was the IP address of this machine that we want to try to break into. What do we know? Those are two ports that we can possibly influence. Sorry. So we know that these are two ports that we can... Say again? Influence? Influence. Well, it's kind of hard. So. So we know that we sent out 1,445 uh, UDP messages to ports probably 1 to 1,455. And we got, back, uh, we got back the error message for all but two of them, right? It could be that these ports are, that those packets just got lost. The ICMP, either the UDP request got lost or the ICMP response got lost, right? We, this is an unreliable communication mechanism. We actually don't know that it was successful or not. So where's this third column come from? A dictionary. You want to explain? Well, certain services use certain ports, typically. Exactly. So there are a list, I believe it's, I want to say it's the Internet Engineering Task Force that maintains the list, or it's IANARA, or I can't remember exactly the organization, but if you look up port list, there will be UDP and TCP port numbers from 1 to 65,000, and they are typically used by a specific service. So that's, um, and why this is, if you want to talk to a IP address and you want to make an HTTP request, you need to know what port to talk to. So if you also had to communicate for every single system, the IP address and the port number you want to talk to, that's a lot of information. So the idea is by standardizing, saying most HTTP servers will be running on TCP port 80, you know who to try first. And this actually is a great technique if some networks, uh, so port 22 on uh, TCP is SSH traffic, how to SSH into a server. So some things like airlines or airports or paid Wi-Fi will block all ports except for port 80 or 443. And so you can get around this by configuring your server to accept TCP connections on port 80. Um, and then they just think it's web traffic, but it's clearly not. Cool. So what I would do here next is then validate, are these, are these services, I, I would look at what the heck is NetBIOS NS? I would, Maybe it's like NetBIOS network storage or something. And DGM is, I, don't, I have no idea what that stands for. So you would then dig into this to find out what are these things. Have we found all the open ports that potentially are on this server? Shake your head, why not? Because I asked the question? Yeah. <laughs> There's 65,000 ports. And yeah, there's 65,000 ports, and this NMAP scan says it only scanned 1,445 ports. Right? So why did it do that? Uh, pretty sure that that's the, from one to that number, or maybe a little less, I can't remember, is the dedicated service ports that have specified ports for things like SSH and Telnet and FTP. Yeah, so the short, well, 
Uh, you can look this up for more details, but essentially most of the more common services run uh, usually, I think it's 1024 or less. And those are all the standard services that you mainly care about. However, we actually don't know, maybe there are others that are being used that we could use as an attack vector. So this would actually be a very poor penetration test because we're not actually knocking on every door in the apartment complex, right? We want to make sure we configured our end map to do this scan. And I actually have an example of doing this where we found a, um, what's the network management protocol on servers? It's like I, IPMP, I think, which allows you to connect to servers in their admin page like and reboot servers or re-image them. So we found out that their credit card processing machine had this available to any developer or anyone on their local network. And they were shocked that we found this. And literally it was because I used the nmap with scan all ports option because they had a machine, uh, they had a dedicated machine that would scan internally in the networks, but their scans only scanned the first 1,000 ports. And so because they had misconfigured their scan, they missed this vulnerability in their network. Uh, IPMI, that's the name of it, IPMI. It, a lot, and it could have, I didn't do it because this was literally their actual credit card processing machine. Um, and so this, if I messed it up, it could have taken down their business for the day, which for a company that processes credit cards is a very big deal. So we just showed them what we found and then they said, do not do anything there, we will fix that. But it was a good uh, finding and it's a good way of showing like, these defaults, defaults are defaults, right? But you should think about what is actually happening here and is it what you want to have happen? Yes, okay, that's good. All right, so TCP, the other awesome protocol to transport layers that is most often used. TCP is where things actually get more interesting in terms of guarantees. So TCP actually allows for a connection-oriented reliable stream delivery service. So you actually have no loss, no duplication, no transmission errors, and the correct ordering. So that you know when you send FUBAR, and the OS has told you, yes, that's confirmed, that the other side actually saw FUBAR. This is super cool, super important. Um, just like UDP, TCP has the port abstraction. So we'll see how this is actually guaranteed, but it's important to understand that TCP offers these guarantees. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting to think about, right, is does every single network application need all of this functionality, right? Does every single network application need no loss, no duplication, no transmission errors, and correct ordering? You could maybe think of some services where maybe loss is okay, but correct error, correct ordering is get, like really good, right? Which may be the streaming option. You'd want the frames to come one after another, but if one of them drops, it's fine. Just keep going, like let the movie play, right? So you, which, how you have to actually do that is build those mechanisms on top of UDP. So um, you know, TCP is great because it provides all of these nice guarantees, but um, other ways can be definitely better. So, so super important concept of TCP is this connection oriented. So how do we know that connections actually exist in TCP? So the idea is a connection exists between four things. This is important, four tuple. The source IP, the destination IP, and the source port and destination port. This is what forms a connection, a TCP connection. The so source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port. And you gotta think this, this identifies one flow, right, from source to destination. That reverse tuple is the reverse flow. And so TCP is set up to allow this full duplex so both sides can talk to each other. And talking about the socket abstraction, so usually the combination of IP port is sometimes called a socket. So TCP, so looking at the header, we first have our 16-bit uh, source port, 16-bit destination port, so we can see we have exactly the same number of ports in UDP and TCP. After that, we have some other packets that we'll get into. We have headers, flags, win, uh, checksum, urgent pointer options, padding, and data. So 
the TCP segment, so if we think about, again, adversarially, an attacker can completely control the source port, the destination port, the sequence number, acknowledgement number, all of these, flags, window, urgent pointer. I guess I should have colored all of this, right? So like a, an adversary can control and spoof TCP packets that have all of these values, just like we saw at every layer. And just like before, TCP is encapsulated inside IP, which is encapsulated inside Ethernet frames. Cool. So how do we actually get Connection-oriented, reliable stream delivery service with no loss, no duplication, no transmission errors, and the correct ordering. When we're building, do any of the other layers underneath us guarantee this? Because then that would be super easy, right? We'd say, yeah, yeah, I do this because I'm using IP, which provides all this stuff, right? The next thing is that works up. So when you do HTTP or something that uses TCP, you know you have all of these properties. You don't have to do it specially yourself. Cool. All right, I'm going to do it. All right, it all comes down. So first, we need to actually establish a connection with another server. So we need to, with because we want to see, is that machine up and alive? Right? We want to establish, we need to establish a way to communicate with that other system. I'm going to derive it. I think that would be better. So we are the client. <coughs> we have a server we want to talk to. So we know the server's IP address. We know the port. Right? We are some computers. We have each our local networks. And then we have basically like the internet thing here, right? Uh. <coughs> so we're the client, we can talk to the server, right? So we can send packets from us to the server, right? In general, we saw that at the IP layer, right? We can send packets to them, cool. So we can send, essentially we can think of it as like a start packet, we can send some packet that says, hey, I want to talk to you on this port, right? So we send that packet to the server, the server gets that, what should they do? In general, I mean, we're not even talking about the protocol, we're just thinking through, do they say, great, or they just internally go, yes, this is awesome, everything is connected. Send a response back. Send a response back. Why do they need that response? The client has no way of knowing, did this packet actually get to the server or not, right? Because IP does not guarantee that. They may have gotten 10 copies of this packet. They may have gotten zero. They may have gotten half of this packet, right? So the client then needs to send a response back. Now, think about this from the client's perspective. How does the client know that this response is in response to the original request that they sent. Or think about it in a different way. A client gets a packet back, sees that it's a response packet. What do they know? So what information, let's say, just from the layers we've talked about so far, what information is contained in this packet? IP address. So this has the. So this will have um, IP of the server. Oops, that's not the wrong. The IP of the server, and obviously the IP of the client. Right. So definitely, that's there. So the <coughs> client knows that it got a packet from this server's IP address. It knows that it's a. We'll call it a response to the setup message first, so that it can know that it got a response back. But How does it actually know that it's in response to this initial, how does it know that this isn't a response to a request it made yesterday, or an hour ago, or 30 minutes ago, or 15 minutes ago? Now 
We need some other bit, we need some other type of information, right? We want to know, so basically you can think about it as we're kind of sending like some random value back to the server and saying, hey, send me that random value back. And if you send that back to me, then I know that this is actually a response to my request. Um, so we'll call this, this uh, the sequence number for right now. So we send some sequence number and then essentially sends back, well, the other interesting thing is that actually we'll send back sequence number plus one. Um, the reason for this is that uh, every know the differences between little Indian and big Indian? Vaguely. Remember that from an architecture class way back when? So now it's coming back. So the question is, what if you have these bytes? Is this a large number or a big number? It depends. It depends on which byte is the most significant byte, right? It depends if this is memory address, I don't know, one. If this is memory address one, and this is memory address two, and let's go 02, 03. And this is memory address three, and this is memory address four. If we said at memory address one, or we call it four, yeah, whatever. If we said this memory address, what type of number is this? Is it FF010203 or is it 030201FF? So that's the difference between little Indian and big Indian. So super annoying is that most processors are little Indian, right? So it's actually reverse order. So if you saw a physical memory in increasing order FF010203, when that number is interpreted, all those bytes are flipped around. So the number that it represents is 030201FF. However, on the network is different. The network, I believe, is, is big Indian. Because of this, the design of TCP actually, so I know I sent this, this um, start a message request to the server. I put some sequence number there. I want to know, can that machine actually speak the TCP protocol correctly? Can it add one correctly? Right? Because if it adds one in little Indian, or in the wrong order, it'll increment the biggest number and completely change. So it's not a increment by one. So this is kind of a, an interesting, I really like this, because it seems like a minor detail that's silly, but it's actually incredibly important to building this protocol back in like the 80s when they were first doing this, or 60s, 70s, whenever they were first designing this. So it gets back uh, sequence number plus one. So client. So from the client's perspective, are they good to go? Yeah, they should be. Right, they send them back. So they know that the server received their request, right? They know the pack that the server got this start packet, right? Because they saw a response with sequence plus one from that IP address. This is good. But what about the server? What does the server know from its perspective? That it's received a packet and sent a packet, but it doesn't know if the packet it sent was received. It doesn't know, it does not know, did the client receive this packet or not? So we need a third verification step. We need a step for the client to say, all right, let's good. we're good to go, let's talk, right? So. We'll call it an acknowledgement packet for now. Sends it back to the server. But how does the server, in a similar way that we thought about from the client's perspective, when the client got this response, how did it actually know that it was in response to this initial packet? Similarly, think about it from the server's perspective. I sent some packet, some response back that, yeah, I'm ready to talk. But how I know this response back from the client is actually for that one and not from 10 minutes ago or five minutes ago, like how can I link that to that specific response? Sequence number? Yeah, so we use the I concept again, but we already have a sequence number, so, um, so essentially you can think about both sides have a different sequence number, so, although it's a little, well, so essentially the server in its response will create some new random number that's called the acknowledgement number. And this way, 
when the client responds back as that sequence number, it actually has the ACK plus one. And it will say, I believe, sequence plus one to say that it's actually as its acknowledgement number. So from both sides, they kind of use this and flip it. But the key point is they both send each other some information so that they can link all of these conversations together. And now at this point, once that server gets that, now it knows that this connection is established. So there is now a communication link between the server and the client. They are both good to go, good to talk to each other. Now they can actually start transmitting data. Cool. So one of those things I would burn into your brain because you'll probably be asked this by uh, people is how does this actually work? So it works with flags. So the, flat, the TCP flags are how the client send, asks the server, hey, I would like to start a connection. And so the way it does that is by setting the sin flag as one. So here, it's, so these are all, all mapped to the headers. So we have 13987. So just like UDP, it creates a random source port and says, OK, source port 13987, I want to talk to destination port 22, which is SSH. And it randomly generates some sequence number. It says, OK, 6574. That actually doesn't matter what it is. It should be randomly generated, as we'll find out. And at this point, there is no acknowledgment number. So it's usually just 0. And it sets a sin flag to 1 which you can think of as sin as like synchronized, right? You're trying to synchronize your connection. So the sin flag is set. So usually we consider this and we call this a sin packet. So the first step of the TCP three-way handshake is a sin packet. The server gets this and says, yep, I, I, so first, obviously it has to check, is there a process running on this system that is listening for packets on port 22? If it's not, then go away, don't talk to me. Right? But if it is, then great, let's continue this conversation. So it flips the source and destination ports, right? because it's now sending yeah, from 22 to 13.987. I'm like, I know it's flipped. Okay. Um, and it uses its acknowledgment number so as the sequence number plus one. So the sequence number here is 6574, it's 6575. And, the, and now it generates for its sequence number a new random number that says, great, when you reply back to me, use this number plus one in the sequence number, and I'll know that it's actually you. And the way it specifies that this is a response and not, remember an important thing is, if the sin flag is just set, this would indicate a initiate connection message from the server to the client is not what we want. So this is a, you can call a syn act packet. So synchronize and acknowledge. So syn act packet. Then finally the client gets this and sends back the final act packet. So no syn, just an act. And sends back the sequence number of 6575 and the acknowledgement of 76112. So this is an adding one to that sequence number. And now we are good to go and good to communicate data. We've established a three-way handshake here. So again, super, super important three-way handshake. Sin, sin, act, act. And then that sets up the TCP connection. Cool. Questions? We have the data exchange on Tuesday, and then we're actually close to 